Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending where in the world you are. I'd like to welcome you today to the e-seminar uh, from ERA entitled Low Protein Diets and Keto Analogs in CKD, a Medical and Health Economic Perspective. My name is Carla Vizani. I'm a renal dietitian, associate professor in nutrition at Karolinska Institute and senior research specialist in the same university. Uh, I also would like to welcome our speakers and panelists for today. So we have a great group. I'm sure you'll be uh, satisfied with all the lectures. So we start with Professor Liliana Garneata. She is an associate professor of nephrology with a doctor habilitation in Carlo Davila, University of Medicine and Pharmacy, uh, Department of Internal Medicine and Nephrology. She is a senior consultant in nephrology in Romania. She is the director of the Romania Renal Registry, and she is an author of more than 100 papers published in national and international journals. She has a special interest in nutrition and metabolism in kidney disease, diabetic nephropathy, epidemiology of chronic kidney disease, and renal anemia. I also would like to welcome Dr. Lorenzo Pradelli. Dr. Pradelli was educated as a medical doctor at the University of Torino, where he began working in the Department of Pharmacology on health and technology assessment and biological modeling. In the past 20 years, he has actively worked as a consultant for numerous international and national stakeholders in health economics, outcomes, and evidence synthesis. And lastly, but not least, I welcome also Dr. Alice Sabatino. She, is, uh, she has a background as a renal dietitian with many years of experience in Italy at the Parma University Hospital. She is a researcher at Karolinska Institute in Sweden, a board member of the European Renal Nutrition Working Group, and their coordinator of the Renal Module for the Lifelong Learning Program in Clinical Nutrition and Metabolism developed by the Aspen Society. And she is also uh, one of the fellows of the long-term fellowships from IRA. Currently, she's finishing her fellowship in Sweden at Karolinska Institute. So I welcome you all today for this e seminar. I'd like to invite Liliana to share her screen. Thank yes. you very much, Liliana. The floor is yours. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I would like to to take uh, in this e seminar. Uh, the idea of low protein diets and keto analogs from a medical perspective. And of course, I'm more than honored and happy to participate in this ERA uh, meeting. Now, the question of the low protein diets is quite old, I would say. The first data related to their efficacy and their safety appeared back in 1964 in The Lancet, and they nicely showed, actually an Italian team showed that low-protein diet seems useful to postpone kidney replacement therapy through a better control of metabolic disorders in advanced CKD. And I'm talking mainly about nitrogen balance, metabolic acidosis, and mineral bone disorder. But then the MDRD came with the conflicting results and the interest for renal nutrition uh, became lower. But more recent data support the possibility to reduce the rate of decline in kidney function by nutrition intervention, mainly through a better metabolic control, uh, through a better metabolic control, but also through a better control of blood pressure and the reduction in proteinuria. They are also discussing about the amelioration of insulin resistance, particularly important in diabetic nephropathy and also in obese patients. Why should we try a low protein diet in, uh, in CKD patients? And this is not only the better metabolic control as I shown earlier, but there is also a hemodynamic effect. And if we look at the glomeruli, coming with a high protein diet or even normal, we are causing vasodilation of the afferent arteriola 
and we increase intraglomerular pressure. But if we reduce the protein intake, then will be vasoconstriction, reduction in intraglomerular pressure, and reduction in the rate of glomerular sclerosis. Actually, coming with a low protein diet fits very well with ACE inhibitors use with vasodilation of the efferent arteriola comes together with low sodium diet who also increase uh, the intraglomerular pressure and also with this new class, quite new class of the SGLT2 inhibitors. So low protein diet comes to make an umbrella with all these agents in order to reduce the uh, glomerular sclerosis. And now just to be very clear, uh, the low protein diets needs an individualized approach. There is no number uh, that fits for everybody. But in the spirit of this lecture, in order to, uh, to use correctly and uh, everybody to understand the abbreviation, we are talking about conventional low protein diet, the so-called LPD, with 0.6 gram of proteins per kilo per day. We are discussing about supplemented LPDs, which are again 0.6 plus keto analogs, one tablet per 10 kilos of body weight. And we are also talking about the vegetarian, very low protein diets, 0.3 to 0.4, supplemented with keto analogs of essential amino acids, one tablet for uh, five kilos of dry body weight. And this is the so abbreviated SVLPD. Now, I will uh, take in parallel the efficacy and the safety of the uh, protein restriction. And I considered it's, it would be interesting to, to share with you uh, the experience, the local experience, the experience uh, of our team. First of all, with keto analog supplemented VLPD uh, on a CKD progression. Uh, this is a study that we published many years ago we we have uh, we have assessed for eligibility more than 1400 people and the people who um, could enter the study uh, were admitted in a running period during which we prescribed in all patients 0.6 gram of protein per kilo per day and only those who proved adherent to this diet were then randomized to receive either a supplemented VLPD or a conventional LPD. And what I like to underline is that assessed more than 1,400 and randomized to 100. This is just 14% of patients who really proved adherent to the diet. And the results, we look first at the uh, need for dialysis or a reduction of more than 50% in the GFR and only 13% of the patient on SVLPD uh, uh, reached this endpoint as compared to 42% in the control group. And more interesting is that this difference still remained even if we adjusted for the other factors known to interfere uh, you know, with this uh, endpoint, like blood pressure control, like the proteinuria level, etc., And probably the secret behind this success is the compliance. And one can see that the compliance to the prescribed diet was very close uh, to the prescription in both arms and throughout the study. As for the safety side, we found no significant change in any of the studied parameters of the nutritional status in, in any group. How good is the uh, supplemented VLPD? Now, we have to treat 20 patients for three years with statins in order to avoid the heart attack in one. Five patients for uh, 10 weeks with antibiotics in order uh, to avoid in one the ulcerous, but 
we have to come with a nutritional intervention in three patients for one year in order to avoid dialysis in one patient. And this is um, quite interesting. But again, coming to the safety, is it possible and it's safe on a long term? And these are uh, the results of um, the follow-up of the patients in the previous study. Actually, there were 200 patients ended up in the previous study, and um, they were enrolled in this follow-up trial, 101 on SLPD and 99 in uh, LPD with no differences been between groups. And one can see that only 16%, 17% of the patients in the SVLPD group uh, died as compared to uh, 36 percent in uh, in controls and uh, interesting again uh, the median time to follow up was significantly higher and one can see in the keto diet group it was 129 that is more than 10 years the median again follow up Looking at the Kaplan-Meier analysis of the patient survival, the probability um, of uh, to survive at five years was 96% in SPLPD as compared to 82% in controls and the difference was again uh, significant. And a multivariate regression analysis of the factors related to survival like age, gender, modality of dialysis, the comorbidity score, Davies, and also the type of nutrition revealed that only the type of nutritional intervention was associated with this survival advantage that I presented. As for the need of kidney replacement therapy, 51% of patients in SPLPD required dialysis as compared with 93% in controls. And again, the secret, and that's definitely very interesting behind, is the compliance to the diet. In patients who did not start kidney replacement therapy, the compliance to the nutritional intervention remained voluntarily at the same level and very good throughout the follow-up period. In other words, those receiving SVLPD during the study continued the same type of uh, diet and the ones in controls uh, did the same. Uh, looking again at the nutritional state, we found no changes or anyway, no deleterious changes in the nutritional status on long-term in any arm. Now, this is true for non-diabetic patients. I'm sorry, I think I, I missed uh, to say that uh, in this randomized control trial, we enroll just non-diabetic patients. But what about diabetic patients? And we try to look at low-protein diet supplemented with keto analogs in patients with severe DKD and uh, severe proteinuria. This is a prospective interventional uh, study, not randomized or not so far. And again, it was a run-in period and then the intervention period of one year with supplemented LPD, I mean 0.6 protein and keto one capsule for 10 kilograms of uh, ideal body weight. And for time reasons, I choose just to summarize the results. With supplemented low protein diet, we were able to significantly reduce the blood pressure by 10 millimeters of mercury, to significantly reduce proteinuria with 3.5 gram per, uh, per gram, which is uh, definitely about 70% of the initial value. And it was also a better control of uh, glucose uh, metabolism. On total, the rate of decline in kidney function was reduced by about 5 mils per minute per year. In other words, the, uh, the, the red line uh, is 
the expected trend of GFR in case we did not uh, start any intervention. It was uh, it was appreciating considering the historical data of the patient. And the gray line is what we actually observed in our patient. And we can see that it was expected that in 10 months, all the patients to be on dialysis. But what happened, sorry, is that nobody needed dialysis. And again, the rate of decline in kidney function was uh, significantly uh, ameliorated. So to conclude, uh, this data, the low protein diet supplemented with keto analogs seems to be effective and safe in postponing kidney replacement therapy in advanced CKD, both in diabetics and in non-diabetes, in carefully selected and closely monitoring patient. In diabetic kidney disease, Keto-supplemented LPD was associated with reduction in proteinuria by 70%, a better blood pressure control, and a reduction of five times in the rate of decline of GFR. So LPDs are safe on long-term, associating better kidney survival and better patient's survival. And now we are coming to the recently released um, clinical practice guidelines for um, evaluation and management of CKD. And we can see here in a practice recommendation that in adults with CKD who are willing and able and who are at risk of kidney failure, consider prescribing under close supervision a very low protein diet 0.3.4 as showed supplemented with essential amino acids or keto acids analogs wherever the general recommendation is of 0.8 but again in carefully selected patients um, it worse to prescribe sub such type of nutritional intervention. And this is uh, the, the old Cinderella story that I always used to present. And it is time to be revisited since it seems that um, nutrition or diet, it's not anymore uh, the Cinderella, but we can change it for this flower where diet is just a part uh, in the complex management of um, advanced chronic kidney disease. Thank you very much for your attention. And again, thank you for invitation. Thank you so much, Liliana, for this very informative and great lecture. And now I invite Dr. Lorenzo Pradelli for his lecture. Please, Lorenzo, share your slides. Good evening to everybody. I'm also very pleased uh, to be, have been invited uh, to the seminar. I've been asked to convey uh, the information in the medical literature on the economic uh, aspects of a uh, supplemented very low protein diet. Uh, so the health economic uh, perspective. So as you all know, uh, CKD is a highly prevalent and it is a major source of uh, global healthcare costs, contributing uh, to high percentages of the total expenditure in healthcare in advanced countries. Uh, this relevant economic burden is uh, primarily attributable to the management of patients with end stage renal disease who require uh, either dialysis or transplantation. So the bulk, even though they represent a small percentage or a relatively small percentage of the total uh, CKD population, those in dialysis or uh, who receive transplantation uh, account for uh, the great majority of the total cost for managing uh, kidney disease. Uh, as Professor Ganeata has just uh, nicely uh, illustrated to us, uh, uh, key uh, supplementation on top of uh, protein-restricted diets uh, proved uh, uh, to be able to delay the need for renal replacement therapy. And therefore, it is very logical that uh, 
there is some potential to reduce uh, the economic impact of CKD related healthcare costs uh, and also in the indirect costs uh, associated uh, to the inability of patients uh, to contribute uh, to the social welfare of the country in which they are. Uh, however, as far as uh, we know, uh, the cost analysis of the KA supplementation are not very common in literature. So um, to prepare for this uh, seminar, uh, we ran a desktop uh, literature review, searching uh, Medline and Embase uh, from any date published uh, up to August uh, to identify any published cost analysis uh, which involves uh, KA supplementation in uh, uh, kidney patients. Uh, using a, a very uh, basic uh, PICOS scheme, uh, so searching for uh, 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 sorry, uh, chronic kidney disease uh, patients in any stage uh, who receive any diet uh, with protein restriction supplemented with KA uh, compared to any other uh, diet uh, and reporting on uh, healthcare costs. We ended up with uh, five published papers, which I'm going to show you in the next slides. So these are uh, this is a list of the uh, of the published studies that, that we were able to retrieve. As you see, uh, most of them are published uh, in uh, in the East. So we have three publications uh, for Vietnam, Taiwan, and Thailand, and one in Kazakhstan. Uh, one in Taiwan and one for Europe, uh, conducted for the Hungary. Uh, as you see, not all of these are uh, actually published uh, as uh, uh, full papers. Two of those, the Kazakh paper and the Hungarian uh, analysis, are just uh, poster abstracts. So we confirm that the literature is uh, limited. But as you can see, uh, the results are very consistent. So I uh, will invite you to look at the last column uh, of this uh, of this table. And uh, there is a high consistency in the sense that uh, for all uh, contexts that have been analyzed, uh, we end up uh, with uh, beneficial effects in terms of uh, quality adjusted life. As you see, we have always a gain in all comparisons. So it is uh, better for the for the patients. They experience uh, an enhanced uh, and extended uh, life expectancy thanks to the thanks to the intervention and a concurrent uh, saving uh, on healthcare cost, uh, which is a, a quite. Uh, a quite particular results in, in health economics. Uh, we're usually, uh, uh, we're used uh, to assess uh, uh, treatments uh, which uh, offer a clinical advantage, but uh, with, with a trade-off uh, on the economic uh, side. So we need usually to spend more money to improve the, uh, the health of the populations uh, we are caring for. In this case, and in other cases in nutrition, uh, we have uh, what is called the dominance in pharmacoeconomic terms meaning that uh, we have a concurrent advantage in uh, terms of clinical and economical benefits. Uh, <clears throat> in reality, the, the cost-effective analysis uh, that were developed uh, for the Asian countries, uh, Vietnam, Taiwan, and Thailand, are based on the, on the same model, uh, which was a model that uh, we developed uh, some time ago basing on the data presented by uh, Professor Garneata, which then have been adapted to many other contexts uh, in Europe, Asia, and South America. While the other three uh, were independent studies, so uh, we did not participate uh, in the modeling, uh, the three published in, in full are uh, based on the same model adapted to the, to the local settings. Uh, the unpublished analysis, uh, uh, which are quite, uh, I'm gonna show you on the map, uh, have been used uh, for uh, ketosterol negotiations uh, with a regulatory agency in uh, in many countries. They, they have been convincing uh, to the regulators uh, uh, who granted reimbursement uh, for the drug. So uh, this is uh, what we are talking about. So we have uh, South America with Brazil. We have Europe have many many examples: uh, Spain, Belgium, and the Netherlands, Italy. Uh, Croatia, uh, Poland, and Sweden. 
and then uh, in the in the east, as I said, we have Kazakhstan, uh, uh, Taiwan, uh, <clears throat> and Thailand. Focusing, uh, so uh, the model I was talking to you about, this is a quite simple simulation model, uh, which is called the Markov model, which uh, tries to replicate uh, the life experience of the, the patients uh, according to the two alternative treatments. So supplemented very low protein diet versus low protein diet itself. All patients start in uh, CKD stage four plus, uh, not yet on uh, replacement therapy. And they can either stay in this uh, stage according to the clinical inputs or move on to dialysis and in some special cases also renal transplantation according to the country setting or from, from any of these uh, two health states they can uh, uh, transit uh, to the absorbing state which is the death and the, the end of the, of the simulation. So to populate uh, this model uh, uh, we use the country-specific uh, parameters uh, uh, for uh, uh, what we call life expectancy, uh, the proportion of uh, hemodialysis on uh, peritoneal dialysis on the total population, the use of renal transplantation, and the cost data. While the, the clinical data, the clinical engine uh, of the model is the same and is uh, based on uh, Gagnata 2019, as told you before, with this associated risk of dialysis, which come from an elaboration of the published data. So about uh, one fourth of the patients will go into dialysis if treated with LPD versus a very low, very smaller percentage with supplemented very low protein diet with a hazard ratio of 0 0.24, which is almost an 80% reduction of the risk of entering into dialysis. Uh, while the annual mortality, as said, is country specific. So according to each country, uh, we have the specific ratio of HD, HD over PD, where he, HD is hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis of about four to one with variations among countries. The utilities, uh, which for those of you who are not uh, very acquainted uh, with uh, health economics, uh, the utilities are quality of life weights uh, used to adjust uh, uh, life expectancy to take into account uh, uh, the quality of life or the, the, the patient experience uh, in the phases. So it is associated to uh, 0.8, where zero is a death and one is perfect health. Uh, these are uh, published utilities uh, by studies uh, conducted in uh, 2012. And uh, so, as you see, uh, the entering into dialysis uh, implies a reduction in the quality of life. Uh, 0 0.69 versus 0 0.79 for hemodialysis in it, a little better with uh, continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis and uh, even better than pre-dialysis, according to this estimate, uh, with automated uh, peritoneal dialysis. So these weights uh, uh, are uh, attached uh, to the to the life expectancy. Then we consider uh, with local prices, obviously, uh, the cost for the supplementation itself, the cost uh, for uh, diet monitoring, uh, other supplementations uh, which uh, may be needed, uh, always according to, to the data published by Garneata, and then the dialysis, uh, the dialysis cost. In some countries, uh, in particular in Sweden, where they, uh, where this is very important, uh, we also uh, elaborated on indirect cost, which is productivity losses uh, due to dialysis of the patient and the caregivers. So focusing on uh, Europe, uh, we have analyzed uh, the economic value of the supplementation, both in terms of uh, uh, allocation. So cost effectiveness analysis uh, tells us if it is a uh, uh, sensible to invest uh, the money if it is efficient as an allocation for the health system, while budget impact analysis uh, evaluates whether it is uh, sustainable by, by the financing system. Uh, and so mainly we conducted cost effectiveness analysis for most countries. Uh, in uh, Belgium and the Netherlands, uh, they also wanted to see uh, budget impact analysis. 
So uh, the results are, uh, on average, which I'm presenting here, are, again, uh, as we saw already in the table on the literature review, really encouraging. So it is estimated uh, that the survival will increase on average uh, by one year uh, if patients will receive a supplemented very low protein diet instead of a low protein diet, corresponding to an almost 20% increase in the life expectancy, with a delay in uh, dialysis of uh, almost three years, uh, corresponding uh, to a doubling of the time uh, before dialysis in, in this patient cohort, with a quality of life improving by almost one year in perfect health state, zero eight quality. You can read quality as one year spent in a perfect life state. So the gain is uh, relevant, very relevant, uh, corresponding to one, about one fifth uh, of, the, of the expected uh, quality of life, adjusted expe life expectancy in, uh, in LPD patients with the savings for the system of about uh, 35,000 uh, euros per patient, uh, corresponding to almost a 30% reduction in the, in the global costs. So some more details uh, by country. So as you say, uh, these are not uh, homogeneous uh, uh, everywhere. In some countries, depending on the utility, on the life expectancy, uh, the variation in qualities uh, ranges from a plus 10% uh, to a plus uh, almost 30% uh, uh, in Poland. And so uh, the savings, uh, depending on the, on the cost structure in each country, uh, are oscillating uh, between uh, in about a rough 20% savings uh, in uh, uh, lower budget countries like Poland and uh, Croatia, uh, to higher savings uh, as it gets uh, as it get most most intense uh, the the impact uh, of healthcare costs uh, uh, in the specific country. In Sweden, we also included a societal cost. Uh, uh, the uh, the impact is even even higher if we consider the full impact uh, on the society as a as a whole, uh, not only on the health system. So in conclusion, uh, the literature is uh, is limited uh, as, as we started off, uh, but uh, it converges into indicating a concurrent benefit uh, on both clinical and economic sides of the KA supplementation on supplemented very low protein diet. The simulation model that has been used may, mainly uh, demonstrates uh, that uh, K supplemented VPID is dominant, uh, as I was mentioning to you before, dominant is a jargon term to, to indicate situations uh, where one alternative is uh, both more effective and less costly than the other one in, in all examined uh, countries in Europe. And uh, I, I really believe that in light of the increasing prevalence uh, of end-stage renal disease and the substantial costs of renal replacement therapy, these findings uh, warrant uh, implementation by healthcare policies uh, aimed at postponing the need for dialysis therapy. And so I must agree with Professor Garniata in saying that this has to be one of the petals in, in the flower of uh, rational and appropriate uh, clinical management of uh, CKD patients. And with this, I conclude. Uh, thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lorenzo, for your very informative lecture as well. And thank you for both lectures for having it on time. So we have time for Q&A. And we already received um, some questions in the, in the chat. And we also had some questions from the participants even before the seminar that they sent by mail. But I'd like to start with some questions that we got already on the chat. And I think there is a very important question here that we need to make clear. And I'd like to invite Liliana to answer this question. And this question, it is, if keto diet is useful for polycystic kidney disease? I think it's good that we clarify about this question. Liliana, would you please answer this? Um, yes, thank you. Polycystic kidney disease obviously gets to 
advanced stages of CKD. So it depends upon the glomerular filtration rate, but of course it is the keto diet, the keto diet. I'm not going to say keto diet anymore because it can be confusing. And this is in brackets. Uh, when I say keto diet, I mean the keto analog supplemented uh, low or very low or anyway protein restricted diet. And there is no relation to the so-called and largely used ketogenic diet. So that's nothing to do one with the other. But maybe it is better if I keep saying SVLPD and not keto diet. So uh, uh, different types of low protein diets would be definitely useful uh, also in uh, polycystic kidney disease, uh, according to uh, to patients uh, GFR and to patients uh, uh, metabolic disorders. Thank you very much, Liliana. And there is another question that I would like to also direct to you, which is uh, for patients with, uh, no, uh, I'm sorry, it's the question here from the chat. Along with the very low protein diet, what would be the minimal dose of keto analogs that would be effective for a patient? So what would be the minimal amount of keto analogs together with very low protein diet? The amount of keto analogs that we are prescribing and that are needed uh, depends on the amount of protein intake. In case we come with very low levels of protein intake, like we have done 0.3 or 0.4, and as recommended also by the guidelines nowadays, then you have to come with the dose recommended by the producer, um, which is the result of uh, old metabolical studies. So we are talking about one tablet for five kilos of ideal body weight um, and dry body weight um, for the S uh, SVLPD. Uh, for the low protein diet or it depends upon, again, the amount of protein intake, then one can get a lower, a lower dose of uh, ketosteryl, of course. For example, if you go to 0 0.8, probably one double for 12 kilos would be enough. You have to make, uh, to carefully make the calculation. For example, 0.6 comes with one tablet for 10 kilos of body weight for our uh, after our uh, calculation. And Thank that's a calculation much. that anyone can, can do. Yes, yes. Thank you. I think it was very clear. And then there are two questions here that are very much related that, that I would like to ask Alice to answer. So the two questions, Alice, are first, if when the patient has a proteinuria, if you compensate on the di in the diet, the amount of protein loss in the urine. And the subsequent question, which is related with this one, is whether, how do you prescribe protein intake for patients with nephrotic syndrome? Thank you. Thank you, Carla, for this question. So usually we will try to compensate the amount of protein lost when the patient is nephrotic. So when the protein loss is above three grams per day. And then you can do this in two ways. You could increase the amount of protein with food that the patient is eating, but you can also use the keto analogs to compensate for the protein loss. Uh, I think when you use the keto analogs, you don't um, increase the, the pressure inside the glomerulus because you're not giving too much protein from the food. And then you also help to control other um, metabolic derangements that can be related to excess protein. But then you would compensate giving the amount of protein that's being lost, not more than that. It's not a hyperprotein diet. Correct. Thank you, Alice. And then I direct another question now to Liliana. And the question, Liliana, is what would be the experience uh, of the use of keto analogs in low protein diet 
in the pediatric for pediatric patients. Uh, thank you, Carla. Very. This is a very interesting question. Um, there are some data uh, published not so many years ago, uh, looking at the pediatric patient. As far as I know, there are studies involving no more than 50 children or something. Um, and they use also a relatively low protein diet plus keto analogs, but we are not talking about absolute protein restriction in children. They are also calculating the pediatric nephrologists, the colleagues I mean, uh, they, um, they somehow associated with the age, with the um, rate of growth of the children. So they um, calculated the protein restriction, not to a normal protein recommendation as per a normal adult, but per, for a specific uh, children. And I was just raising the hand and I was um, uh, wondering if it's useful to add to what Alice said before that with nephrotic syndrome and in other active kidney diseases, the problem is that we are not coming with uh, this type of nutritional intervention in catabolic patients. The keto analog supplementation of a low protein diet will work only in patients who are metabolically stable. And then with keto analogs, we are able to reverse the catabolic processes to anabolism. But in case the patient is catabolic by the disease itself, that's not advisable to do that. We are discussing about a metabolic stable patient. For the children, it is possible. There are data, but of course it needs a lot of uh, a lot of care and, and a lot of attention while calculating uh, the doses. Thank you. Thank you, Liliana, for pointing out this very important consideration that these are for patients who are metabolically stable. And always remember to count also the energy intake, so we are able to provide neutral nitrogen balance. Uh, Alice, I think there is another important question here I'd like to direct to you, and it's about metabolic acidosis. So the question is, I'm wondering whether the effect of the keto analog and low protein diet is not really due to its possible effect on the uh, metabolic acidosis associated with CKD. What do you think? Thank you, Carla. I think this is an interesting question because we need to think about the keto analogs and the diet as um, a bundle. So it comes together. And when you have both of them, what we have, we have less protein, but we have the uh, correct amount of essential amino acids. By reducing protein, we automatically reduce animal food because it's the type of food that has more protein. And animal food will also provide more acid, acid load. So yes, you have an important effect on metabolic acidosis, it will help to control metabolic acidosis. But we also have other effects that are beneficial. We will reduce the production of uremic toxins, for example. It will reduce the pressure in the glomerulus caused by the protein. So it's not only the effect on metabolic acidosis, but all the, the effects combine from these different mechanisms that this combination of diet and keto analog will have on the, on the kidney disease. Thank if, you. Some, if Lidiana wants to add something. You are muted. Uh, no, thank you. I just trying to, to type an answer for a colleague. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, I will direct a question to you now, Lidiana. Okay. Uh, talking about uremia and uremic toxins, there's also another interesting question here where she's asking that it has been commented that tryptophan contained in the formulation of the keto analogs could produce uremic toxins. What, what is your take on this? Have you heard um, of it? This, uh, this should have been a question for Juan Jose. Um, 
I I'm not sure I know exactly what's what's happening specifically with deep tryptophan, but uh, what it is uh, proved so far is that reducing the protein intake and supplementing the diet with keto analogs will oppositely will reduce the level uh, the level of certain uh, uremic toxins. So I really cannot uh, answer specifically on the tryptophan content of ketosteril, but what I can tell you is there are, uh, there are proofs that uh, there are uh, lower um, levels of uh, paracresol and other uremic toxins with uh, this type of uh, nutrition uh, intervention. Thank you, Liliana. Thank you. And now I'd like to attend also our colleagues that sent their questions when they registered for the seminar. And I'd like to ask Alice to uh, answer this. Alice, what do you think can be done to increase adherence to a diet who is low in protein or very low in protein? What would be your advice? How to increase the adherence to the diet? So first we need to measure the adherence, right? If to measure the adherence to the diet, we will ask for the usually use 24 hours recall diaries, and we can also perform the protein catabolic rating if the patient is stable. So we can see that the amount of um, nitrogen in the urine will correspond to the amount of protein that the patient is eating. And if we have a stable body weight and patient, we see with our interview, the patient has good energy intake, that's how we assess adherence. And to improve the adherence of the patient, it's very important that we have um, frequent visits. So we will talk to the patient and educate the patient, explain the importance of uh, adhering to the diet. And we also need to understand the reason why the patient's not adhering to the diet is because of low appetite. So we need to see, understand why is the reason for the low appetite or it's because the patient is not used to eat those kinds of foods. So I think that first the changes from the patient diet to a low protein diet needs to be gradual. That will ensure the patients to be more adherent to the diet. So they slowly can make changes. We, if the problem is the intake of energy, we try to help the patient find energy dense solutions so they don't need to have a higher volume of food. And in this case also, they would be having maybe more protein depend on the type of food. So we help patients find uh, solutions regarding the amount of of the type of, of food to provide more energy. If the problem is the adherence with the pills, with the keto analogs, then we need to talk to the patient and try to reach uh, the, a common ground. And if necessary, we need to increase a little bit the amount of protein the patient can eat so we can reduce the number of pills that we provide with keto analogs because we cannot think about this diet as a fixed diet that you cannot change. Actually, it's all the way around. We need to adapt the diet to the patient and help them adhere to the diet and have a success treatment, successful, successful treatment. Thank you, Alice. And uh, under your comment, I'd like to invite uh, the participants to take a look in the Ida cookbook. It's uh, it's on the web page. If you Google it, E R A Ida Cookbook, you will find many recipes that were developed, and we have recently revised these recipes with recipes that contain exactly the energy dense foods to help patients to adhere to the diet. So please take a look. And I think there is also an interesting question here on the chat, Liliana. Maybe you could help us. Um, what about the the therapy of keto analogs and low protein diets to patients that received kidney transplant? What what, what is your experience on yeah, this? It, it, is a, it is a very interesting question and I have already typed uh, um, an answer to a short answer to, to the colleague. Uh, yes, it's, um, it's challenging. There are not too many data. 
uh, up to my knowledge, but of course my knowledge is limited as everything is in this world. Um, uh, there are some data coming from Czech Republic looking at uh, keto supplementation and uh, low protein diet in some transplant patient. But theoretically speaking, um, a patient, a transplanted patient with a uh, graft failure or with failing kidney function is very similar metabolically to a patient with CKD in predialysis. So theoretically speaking, it should work. Uh, we do not have so far a personal experience, but we are uh, seriously uh, trying to to look on this aspect yes it's very interesting and uh, again there are very small experiences there are small data but there are i think at least you'd like to say something is it a yes. new hand or old hand no no i'm 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 raising my hand but it's not a comment on this regard actually i wanted to make a question to lorenzo pradelli if possible but let let's wait a little bit okay. for answer a little bit more from the others and then we will finish with your question to Lorenzo. Okay. Um, so I think there is two questions, one from the chat and one we received before that are interconnected and maybe Liliana and Alice could answer. It is, what about the use of keto analogs for patients on pedotoneal dialysis and or hemodialysis? Maybe I think Liliana can answer that. She has more experience. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Carla, and thank you, Alice. Um, it's again a, a very interesting question. Uh, the problem of uh, keto analog supplementation and of certain protein restriction, uh, both in PD and in uh, HD, is a little bit controversial because usually um, people on dialysis are more or less in catabolic state. However, uh, nowadays uh, there are quite some data, most of them coming from Italy, from, uh, from Pisa, and uh, uh, there is this concept of incremental dialysis. Uh, that really makes sense, uh, at least for a certain category of patient. And this means that we, it is not necessary that we start dialysis by the regular schedule, like three sessions a week, but one can do just, let's say, one dialysis a week and in the other uh, days to follow a low-protein diet, plus keto analogs, and it seems it works, and there are really uh, good data uh, in this field. And it is also the same for PD. It seems that associating PD, at least at the beginning, with a low-protein diet plus keto analogs, these allow for a better preservation of, kidney, of residual kidney function, which is definitely important for patient uh, uh, prognosis. And also for uh, the PD patient, uh, there are data to, uh, to show, uh, again, in PD, not at the beginning, in PD in general, there are data to show that it's a, good, a better preservation of, uh, of kidney function. Uh, there is also a trend, and again, there are some data, but not too many, uh, to use on the use of keto analogs in order to ameliorate the nutritional state in uh, in hemodialysis and in in PD patients. But I have no experience in this uh, in this area. I cannot comment on it exactly. Thank you. Alice, would you like to compliment? No, I think no? she said uh, no, thank you. So I think now we are ending, and but before, uh, Alice, would you please make your question to Lorenzo? Yes, <laughs> thank you. Lorenzo, it was very interesting, your your presentation on the in health economics related to, to keto analogs. 
but I saw all the studies that you presented were simulations, right? They did not. Do, are you aware of any RCTs that also evaluated the economic aspects of the diet with keto analogs or, or not? No, I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure that they have not been conducted. And by the way, it would be very difficult to design uh, an RCT uh, with economic endpoints because um, the, the follow-up that you would need to observe the benefit uh, would span at least for some years. So, so you need a, a high percentage of patients entering uh, dialysis in mm -hmm. one of the two groups in order to perform a uh, meaningful analysis. This is why you would uh, have to wait for uh, for a long time. Okay. But I, I, I've seen that uh, Liliana wants to, to comment on this, so I, 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 I keep my answer open. You, you are definitely right. There are no RCTs uh, dedicated to uh, to economical aspects, but uh, there is um, a study by uh, Giuliano Brunori uh, in uh, elderly people, I think there were um, more than 75 years of age or even 80 years of age or something. And uh, he compared SVLPD with dialysis and the uh, health, the uh, medical outcome was excellent. But in a separate and a different paper, uh, they add also some economical calculation, which were definitely in favor of uh, SVLPD. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, yes, uh, from an economical point of view, given uh, the clinical benefit, uh, it, is, uh, it is quite straightforward to expect uh, also a, a long in the long term an economic benefit. It's clear that the, uh, it, it maybe does not talk to who has to decide for the investment because uh, you invest uh, your money immediately uh, and you see the benefit after a while which is uh, the same issue with uh, preventive therapies. When vaccines are questions from the economical point of view, it is the same mismatch between uh, the time in which you spend the money and the time in which you observe the benefit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Okay, but I think we are about to end. We get, got many very interesting questions. It was great participation from the crowd. And I'd like to thank you all and ask if the lecturers would like to give a final um, word on the, on, the, on the seminar before we end. I think I just gave mine. So. Okay. <laughs> uh, Alice and Liliana, would you like to say a final word? Uh, well, I would like also to, only to highlight and remark that we need to think about two things. We do not think on the keto analogs alone. We can need to stop asking the effects of keto analogs on this, on that, on that, because it's the diet with the keto analogs. Keto analogs are there to provide the essential amino acids in enough quantity, otherwise the diet would be poor. So we are talking about the diet with the keto analogs. Mm -hmm. And again, yes. that, we are and also Diana, talking about now, now stable we, patients. Uh, I definitely agree with Alice, and then I want I would like to to close with the guidance recommendations that this protein restricted diets plus keto analogs or plus essential amino uh, amino acids uh, are definitely uh, important for carefully selected for motivated and for carefully monitored patients that's no success without close monitoring and um, without patient and doctor physician and dietitian interaction there's definitely no success yeah thank you very much well, thank you for everyone and I believe Ira now will ask you to answer. Uh, some questions at the end and thank you for having the chance to moderate this great group of lecturers and panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you everybody.